The Toothless Beast This story is from ancient times when humans did not trust dogs and only relied on them for security purposes. Then, when the dog gets older, they have no use for it, and man leaves them alone in the jungle to fend for themselves. A farmer once had a faithful dog called Leonardo, who had grown old and lost all his teeth, so that he could no longer hold on to anything. One day, the farmer was standing with his wife at the front door of their house and said, Tomorrow I plan on taking old Leonardo out into the jungle, because he's no longer of any use. His wife, who felt pity for the faithful beast, answered, He has served us so long and been so faithful that I think we should give him what he's earned. Uh, what? You're not very smart. He doesn't have a tooth left in his mouth, so there's not a thief in the world who would be afraid of him. So now he can leave. He has served us well, and for that he has good food to eat. The poor dog, who was lying stretched out in the sun not far off, had heard everything and was sorry that tomorrow was to be his last day. He had a good friend, the wolf, and he crept out in the evening into the forest to him and complained of the fate that awaited him. Said the wolf, Be of good cheer. I will help you out of your trouble. I have thought of something. Tomorrow, early in the morning, your master is going with his wife to make hay and they will take their little child with them, for no one will be left behind in the house. During work time, the parents will need to lay the child under the hedge in the shade. You lay yourself there too, just as if you were going to guard the little one. Then I will come out of the woods and carry off the child. You must rush swiftly after me as though you were going to take the child away from me. I'll give you back the child, and you will take it back to its parents, who will think that you have saved it, and will be far too grateful to do you any harm. Rather, you will be in high favor, and they will never let you be in need of anything again." The plan pleased the dog, and it was carried out just as it was arranged. The father screamed when he saw the wolf running across the field with his child. But when old Leonardo brought the little one back, he was full of joy and he pet him and said, Not a hair of yours shall be harmed. You shall eat of my food freely as long as you live. And to his wife he said, Go home at once and make old Leonardo some bread sop that he will not have to bite, and bring the pillow out of my bed, and I will give him that to lay upon. From that day on, old Leonardo was as well off as he could ever wish to be. Soon afterward, the wolf visited him, and was pleased that everything had succeeded so well. Ahem. <clears throat> for payment of the favor I did for you, you will turn a blind eye. When I have the chance, I carry off one of your master's fat sheep. Don't count on it. I will remain true to my master. I cannot agree to that. The wolf thought that the old dog must have been joking about not agreeing with him. So? One night, he came creeping about in the night, and was going to take away the sheep. But the farmer, to whom the faithful Leonardo had told the wolf's plan, caught him, and dressed his hide soundly with the flail. The wolf had to pack off, but he cried out to the dog, Just you wait, you scoundrel! You shall pay for this! The next morning, the wolf sent the wild boar, to challenge the dog to come out into the forest so that they might settle the so-called agreement that the wolf thought was broken. Old Leonardo could find no one to stand by him but a cat with only three legs. As they went out together, the poor cat limped along and at the same time stretched out her tail into the air in pain. The wolf and his friend were already at the spot appointed, but when they saw their enemy coming, they thought that he was bringing a sword with him, for they mistook the outstretched tail of the cat for a sword. And when the poor cat hopped on its three legs, they could only think every time that it was picking up a stone to throw at them. So they were both afraid, 
The wild boar crept into the underbrush, and the wolf jumped up a tree. The dog and the cat, when they came up, wondered why there was no one to be seen. The wild boar, however, had not been able to hide altogether, and one of his ears was still visible. While the cat was looking cautiously about, the boar wiggled his ear. The cat, who thought it was a mouse moving, jumped upon it and bit it hard. The boar made a fearful noise and ran away, crying out, Spare me, please! Please, the wolf is up in the tree! The dog and the cat looked up and saw the embarrassed wolf, who was ashamed of having shown himself to be afraid, and he made friends again with the old dog. Then the three of them lived happily ever after, till the day when Leonardo passed away, on the loving laps of the farmer and his wife. The End The Almighty's Conditions Thousands of years ago, a mighty God lived among all the living creatures. He had not yet created humans. The rabbit was the most talented creature at that time. One day, Rabbit visited the god at his palace, which is also in the jungle. It is a pleasure having you in my palace. What can I do for you? Almighty deity, you have control over everybody and everything in this forest. You are a true master. I need a favor. What kind of favor? Just one thing. Please make me wise and intelligent. Well, well, well. Everyone wants to be rich, and you're asking me to make you smarter. Why? Because I want to be more intelligent than all the animals in the forest. Hmm, fine. But you'll have to show me what you're capable of, because I was thinking of making a separate species and granting them wiseness and intelligence. If you prove to me that you're capable, then I will cancel my plans for the creation of humans. What do you think, hmm? I'll do whatever is necessary. If you can get me five blue birds, five white butterflies, a bee as big as you, then I'll see what I can do for you. <laughs> I'll get them. I won't fail. In the forest, Rabbit enters looking tired. He sits on the floor beside a pond. All kinds of animals enter and start drinking water from the pond. Then they leave. Five bluebirds enter and drink water from the pond. Then they start playing and jumping. <laughs> Today I'll know what I'm capable of. No, it can't be. It's not possible. That's not true. I cannot believe it. No, they are not that many. The five bluebirds approach him. Hey, Rabbit, what are you talking about? What's the matter? It's nothing. It's just impossible. Please, tell us what's wrong. Oh, someone told me that you could come with me, but I know that is impossible. You would get tired of the trip. <laughs> are you kidding? We never get tired. We always fly long distances. Flying doesn't make us feel tired. We can go with you wherever you go. The five bluebirds laugh and dance around the rabbit. Great! <laughs> five white butterflies enter and start drinking honey from flowers by the pond. Wow, those are the most beautiful butterflies I have ever seen. <laughs> but. But no, I don't think they can do that. That would be impossible. <laughs> what am I thinking? The five white butterflies approach him. Hey, Rabbit. What are you talking about? What's the matter? Oh, it's nothing. It's just impossible. Please, tell us what's wrong. Uh, well, someone told me that you could come with me, but I know that's just impossible. You would get tired of the trip. <laughs> Are you kidding? You're not serious, right? We never get tired. We always fly long distances. 
Flying doesn't make us feel tired. We can go with you wherever you go. The five white butterflies laugh and dance around the rabbit. <laughs> Great! A big bee enters and drinks honey from a flower. What a beautiful bee! But no, I don't think she can do it. That would be impossible. I must be crazy. The bee approaches him. Hey, rabbit! What are you talking about? What's the matter? It's nothing. It's just impossible. Please, tell me what's wrong. Someone told me that you could come with me, but I know that is impossible. You would get tired of the trip. <laughs> Are you kidding? No, you, you couldn't. I never get tired. I always travel long distances. <laughs> Perfect. Let's go, everybody. Yeah. 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 Hey, wait, you haven't told us where we're going. That's a big surprise. <laughs> Is it good or bad? Oh, good, of course. Come on, before it gets dark. At the God's Palace, the rabbit, five bluebirds, five white butterflies, and the huge bee stand before the God. I was waiting for you. The god was looking at the five birds, five butterflies, and the bee. I see you brought to the company. Will you grant my wish now? I don't think so. Why not? If I make you more intelligent, I would be making a big mistake. How come? Because you are already very intelligent. Then, am I more intelligent than the other animals in the forest? You've always been smart. But you didn't know it. What is your wish? They all start talking at the same time. Rabbit leaves the palace, walking out triumphantly. The End The Tale of Tom Thumb Once, there was a very old beggar who was wandering through the densely wooded forest. One day, when his feet were very sore, he knocked on the door of a one-eyed orc named Gogo and begged for a bite to eat. The orc Gogo and his wife Gigi welcomed the stranger into their cave. While his wife put some bread on a small plate, they realized that their guest was none other than Merlin the greatest and most skillful wizard of all the realms. Oh, great Merlin, please accept our humble assistance. You both are very humble and generous. I am well pleased. Therefore, I wish to offer you anything you desire. He snapped his fingers twice, and then bubbles appeared above his head with images in them. Ah, the skadoosh! Shiny heaps of gold, sparkling diamond mines. Tell me, what do you wish for? Oh, I should be the happiest creature in the world if I had a son. Even if he was no bigger than my husband's thumb, I would be satisfied. Gigi gazed at her thumb in wistful longing. Merlin was so amused with the idea of an orc boy, no bigger than a thumb, that he decided to grant the poor woman's wish. And poof! There came a sweet little orc boy holding Gigi's thumb. The new orc parents felt utter happiness, and they thanked Merlin countless times. Soon after, the wizard departed from his humble host's dwelling. Tom never grew any larger than his father's thumb. That's why everyone called him Tom Thumb. Gogo and Gigi never let their very tiny son disappear from their sight for fear of losing him. 
they crafted a small toy house for him to live in. And as he got older, he became a very cunning and clever lad. One day, Gogo was getting ready to go into the forest to cut wood. He said to himself, "I wish I had someone to drive the cart to me." Father, I can bring the cart all by myself. Gogo laughed, and he answered, <laughs> "Well, let's at least try." When the time came, Tom asked his mother to harness the horse to the cart, and then he sat in the horse's ear and gave him directions. So the horse went the correct way through the densely wooded forest. It happened that, as they turned a corner, Tom was calling out, "Gently, gently!" Two humans responded to his cry of distress. One of them saw the horse and heard the voice, but couldn't see the rider. What an odd thing that is! There goes the cart, and the rider is talking to the horse, but still the rider is not to be seen. They started to follow the cart out of curiosity. Wondering what sort of strange magic this was, the cart drove directly into the forest, and exactly to the place where Gogo was working. Then Tom, seeing his father, called out to him, "Do you see, Dad? I have arrived with the cart." Gogo took his son and put the boy onto his shoulder. The two strangers were looking upward all this time. And did not know what to say, as they were simply flabbergasted. Then one of them rattled the other by the shoulders, saying with greedy excitement, "We must steal the little orc. He would make our fortune. People from all over would pay to see a little freak like him. We'd be rich, rich, I tell you." So. They hastily disguised themselves by covering with branches and leaves. When Gogo was taking a shortcut through the woods, they gingerly grabbed Tom by putting a hand over his tiny mouth and swiftly stuffing him inside their satchel. And just like that, they slipped away, cloaked in the shadows of the tall pines of the forest. Help, Dad! Help me! Tom was shouting, but no one could hear him. The two strange kidnappers journeyed onward till dusk had begun to fall, and Tom requested with urgency in his voice, will, will, "Will you please set me down? I need to go to the bathroom." Don't you fool us, piggy boy. We know you just want to escape and run away, right? No, sir. But if you doubt me, then. I suggest you tie me with a thread. They agreed to bind the boy in a thread, with one end tied to Tom and the other tied to the human's hand. They released him and allowed him to relieve himself. Tom nimbly slipped into a mouse hole and cut the thread with his strong teeth. The men stuck their sticks into the hole, but it was all in vain because Tom crept still farther into the hole. As it became darker and darker, they were forced to give up in frustration. After a while, when Tom realized that his kidnappers were gone, he crept out of the hole. As he was walking, he heard two goblins chatting together about how to rob his father, Gogo. He then came out from the shell and disrupted their scheming with cunning cleverness. I could tell you how. I can slip through the door of the cave. Then into the safe, and I can get you as much gold as you want. What do you say? <laughs> and why would you help us out like that? Hmm. What's in it for you, you little thing? I would get my fair share of the loot, of course. <laughs> yeah. Why not? Let's go then. Goblin carries Tom atop his head, and off they went. As they approach Gogo's cave, Tom slipped through a tiny little crack in the cave and opened the door for them by pulling a small lever that his father had specially made for Tom. 
the two goblins entered the cave, their eyes gleaming with the glitter of greediness. They double-checked to make sure that the orc couple were sleeping and proceeded to stealthily traverse to the treasury room. As the goblins began to selfishly stuff gold into their satchel, Tom closed the treasure room door by pulling yet another lever, trapping them inside. He called out, Dad! Dad, come here! I have captured robbers! Both Gogo and Gigi wake up, with a smile dancing across their faces as they hear their son and run towards the sound of his sweet voice. My little Tom has returned! The whole family cried tears of gratitude and joy at the reunion of their family, as well as the safety of their belongings. Gigi then picked up her son Tom and kissed him. Soon, they heard the whispering of the two would-have-been thieving goblins from the treasure room. <laughs> hey, tomboy, come on, open the door. Your share of the treasure is here, just waiting for you. Um, Tom, you there? Can you hear me now? The whole orc family laughed at their intruder's predicament. And then, Gogo went to teach them a lesson and beat them good and hard. Soon, Tom could hear the goblins crying for mercy and in fear of their lives. When Gogo finally emerged from out of the treasury room, two goblins were swinging upside down in his tightly fisted grasp. And Tom felt so very proud to be the son of such awe-inspiring parents. From now on, we will treat you as the orc treat another. I am proud of you, my son. The End The Happy Prince High above the city, on a tall column, stood the statue of the Happy Prince. He was gilded from head to toe with thin leaves of fine gold. For eyes, he had two bright sapphires, and a large red ruby glowed on his sword hilt. One night, a little swallow flew over the city. She was tired and wished to spend the night between the feet of the happy prince. As she was just about to fall asleep, a large drop of water fell on her. She was curious as there were no clouds in the sky. Then another drop of water fell on her. The swallow decided to look for another place to sleep. Just then, a third drop fell. She looked up and saw that these were the tears from the eyes of the happy prince. The swallow, filled with compassion, asked, Who are you, and why are you crying? I used to be a human and lived in a grand palace. While I was kind, humble of heart, there was no sorrow within my kingdom, and my courtiers called me the happy prince. After my death, I had been set up on a high pillar. My heart is made of lead, and yet it always weeps when I see the ugliness and the misery of my city now. You poor thing. So why are you crying now? Far away in a little cottage, the little boy of a seamstress is sick. He's crying because his mother could not give him anything to eat because she is very poor. And all she has to offer the small lad is water from a nearby river. But the little one's stomach craves food. Then how can you help them from here? Take the ruby from my sword hilt and give it to the poor woman. The little swallow obeyed the prince and then flew to the seamstress's cottage and laid the ruby on her table. She also fluttered over the poor sick boy to give him relief from his fever. As she flew away, the poor mother awoke to find the sparkling ruby resting by her hand. 
both of them felt truly happy. When the swallow returned, the prince said, I can see a writer. He is suffering from the cold and is apparently very hungry. Still, he is writing the story because he will not get anything if he leaves his book unfinished. Dear Swallow, will you please give him the sapphire gem from one of my eyes? No, nope, my prince, I cannot do that. It is my order, dear Swallow. The Swallow did not want to pluck out the sapphire from his eye, but she obeyed the generous prince reluctantly. So the Swallow once again flew into the life of another unfortunate soul, even if it was only for a moment and laid the sapphire upon the writer's desk. She saw that the writer had fallen unconscious due to the cold and suffering from hunger. So she gathered some wood and lit a fire within the man's fireplace. As she flew away from there, the writer felt the warmth of the blaze and slowly awoke. He saw the sparkling sapphire on his desk and with immense joy and gratitude, thanked God for providing it. Upon the return of the tiny swallow, the prince said, I have seen a little match girl whose wares have fallen into the gutter. She is very afraid and quivers with fear, knowing that her father would beat her hard if she returned home empty-handed. You have nothing left on you to give her, sire. Dear Swallow, I still have my other eye left. Please give it to that little match girl. Never, my prince. I cannot do that. For then you would be blind if I took the other sapphire from you. I beg of you, dear Swallow. It is the last time I can help someone. After this quest, I will bother you no more. And you can leave me be and continue on your journey. At his command, the swallow very unwillingly plucked out the sapphire of the other eye of the happy prince, who now was totally blind. The swallow made her final mission for the self-sacrificing statue and silently slipped the sapphire into the palm of the young match girl and returned to the prince, saying, I am not going anywhere, my prince. I will stay here with you till my last breath. From this day forth, I shall be your eyes. Now, the swallow reported daily to the now meager-looking statue of the sufferings of the people. At the command of the happy prince, the swallow took off the golden leaves from the statue and distributed them among the poor people to give them wealth so they could each afford a better life. Now, the statue was dull and gray, as there was no gold left on him. Soon, winter came, and the frost made the swallow colder and colder, so cold that she was about to die. She flew to the happy prince and kissed him on his forehead. This is the final farewell that I shall bid you, my prince. Oh, you have finally decided to continue your journey, my little friend. I am happy for you. Farewell, my little friend. Farewell. No, prince. I am journeying to my death. My death is certain, as I decided to stay with you that day. But I have no regrets about it, for I am at peace and content. The swallow fluttered haphazardly downward to die at the feet of the statue that she had come to admire and love. The prince cried for an immeasurable length of time, and the lead heart which beat within his now gray form broke in two. The mayor ordered that the statue should be pulled down because it was neither beautiful nor useful. But the broken heart did not melt in the furnace. So it was thrown away and came to rest on top of a trash heap where the poor swallow lay dead. Upon seeing this, God determined to put his angels that he had created to a test. So 
he said to them, Bring me the two most precious things upon the earth that I have created. Yes, Lord. The heavenly beings came upon the same dust heap where the dead swallow and the happy prince's heart now resided, a lowly trash heap. And the angels picked them up instantly. O oh, Father of the heavenly lights, these are the two most precious things we found upon your earth. God praised the angel's choice in bringing him the lead heart of the happy prince and the deceased swallow. Now the swallow will stay here in my garden, and the prince will also stay here and enjoy the beauties of my heaven. Now, whenever Swallow and the Happy Prince see suffering upon the earth, their teardrops fall from the sky and rain breaks forth from the clouds. The End The Magic Horse Once upon a time in Persia, at the royal palace, all the kingdom's artists, craftsmen, and strangers would present their skills to the king. If the king was pleased, he would grant them a fine gift. One day, a traveler came before the king and presented an artificial horse. Your Majesty, never has such a thing ever been seen as wonderful as this. But any toy maker can make a toy horse. This is not just a toy, your majesty. On his back, I can ride through the air with the greatest of ease to the most distant part of the earth in a very short time. The man demonstrated the skills of his mechanical horse. The king was amazed and asked to purchase the horse. Oh, your majesty, I couldn't possibly sell such a valuable horse for mere money. Well then, so what do you want? I must have this horsey. The stranger thought for a moment and then offered to give him the horse for free if the king would give him the hand of the princess. The king was about to agree when his son, Prince Darius, came into the room and spoke up in protest. Um, forgive me, father. Were you just about to let this guy marry my sister in exchange for a toy horse? The king, somewhat embarrassed, denied it and asked his son to examine the horse. Prince Darius approached the horse. He leapt onto the saddle and pulled the lever. In an instant, the horse rose high into the air. The king was very pleased, but suddenly realized that his son was so high he could be hurt. He ordered the guards to seize the traveler and put him to prison. Far away in the sky, Prince Darius was carried through the clouds with breathtaking speed. He tried using the lever to turn the horse off, but it did nothing. But he examined the horse further and found another lever, and when he moved it, the horse started to descend. The prince came down close to the ground. Spotting a rooftop higher than all the others, he landed the horse upon the roof of the palace. He came to some steps below. A princess had already been awakened by the sounds she had heard on the roof. She instructed her guards to bring the trespasser to her. The guards brought the prince before her, and he fell on his knees. <clears throat> Forgive me, princess, for awakening you. I am the son of a king. <clears throat> that means I'm a prince, and that's the most important thing about me. The lady was Princess Nadia, the daughter of the King of Bengal. The princess felt glad to hear all about his adventure. Over the next few days, the two of them got to know each other, and before long, they fell in love. One afternoon, the prince said to her, Ah, oh, my princess, I was thinking about our future, and I must go back to my kingdom and ask my father for permission for our marriage. Plus, he would like to know that the magical flying horse didn't smash me into the ground. Wanna come? She agreed. The next morning, they went to the magical, dangerous mechanical horse. Flipping the lever, the two took off, and in 30 minutes, they had arrived at the capital of Persia. The prince first took the princess to a cottage in the woods near the palace. 
Stay here while I go get the toy maker out of prison before he's executed, and I'll mention to my dad that I'm not dead. Most of all, I want to tell my father about you. He'll prepare a reception to welcome a princess. Then, maybe after dessert, I'll tell him I want to marry you. He explained to her how to operate the magic horse in case she might need to flee for safety while he was away. A thief behind the bushes had heard their entire conversation. But can you blame him? They were staying in his cottage. <laughs> what luck! A princess alone and a magic horse! I'll take her to the Sultan of Kashmir, I'll get a fine reward for her, and I'll keep the horse. <laughs> the thief waited for the prince to disappear into the woods. Then he captured the princess, tied her up, and put her on the magic horse. He got on too and pulled the lever just like the prince had said, and the horse immediately rose into the air. The prince, still on the ground, in the woods, was surprised to hear the cries of his princess flying high overhead and he could do nothing about it. While the king was overjoyed to see his son and ordered a stay of execution for the toy maker, he understood why his son must leave again. The prince determined never to return until he had found his princess again. The Sultan of Kashmir was very impressed by the thief and delivered the reward. Then he escorted the princess to his palace. The next morning, he ordered his attendant to tell princess to get ready for the marriage on the same day. There was only one thing she felt she could do. She misbehaved and acted as though she were a crazy and spoiled princess. The Sultan was soon told of this strange development. He offered large rewards to any doctor who would cure her. Meanwhile, Prince Darius had been traveling through many countries uncertain which way to go because he didn't have his flying horse anymore. With nearly all hope gone, he rested on a rock. A few local farmers came by and told him about a princess who had gone mad at the day of her wedding to the Sultan of Kashmir. Suddenly, a flicker of hope lit the prince's heart. Could this be the same crazy princess he fell in love with? And he was determined to find out. Arriving at the capital city of Kashmir, he put on the clothes of a doctor. Then Prince Darius, disguised as the doctor, told the Sultan that indeed the princess could be cured but he would need to speak with her alone. The Sultan agreed. As soon as the prince entered her room, he took her hands in his and whispered, It is I, Prince Darius, your beloved. This lab coat is merely a disguise. In more additional, superfluous, detailed whispers, the prince shared his plan with her. Then he returned to the Sultan. <clears throat> uh, your Majesty, Sultany Peppery, sir, there's a small chance I can save her and bring her back to sanity. You see, she must have touched something enchanted, or watched too many movies as a child. Unless I can examine the magical item, I cannot cure her. The Sultan remembered the magic horse. He summoned the horse and showed it to the doctor. Upon seeing the horse, the doctor said, This is indeed the very magical object that enchanted the princess. <clears throat> Let this horse be brought out into the square before the palace, and let the princess be there. In a few minutes, she will be cured. The following morning, the magic horse was placed in the middle of the square. The prince, posing as a doctor, ordered torches placed around the horse for light. The princess was brought out and led to the horse. The pretend doctor placed her upon the horse. He then ran around it and threw magical black powder into the torches, which raised a cloud of smoke around the horse, so that no one could see the princess and the horse. And hidden in the smoke, the prince mounted the horse, pulled the lever, and the magic horse rose into the air. Sultan, a bride's heart must be earned. It cannot be purchased. That same day, the Prince of Persia and his beloved princess arrived safely at the Persian court. The father rejoiced at the son's return and immediately ordered a great feast. And so the prince and princess lived happily ever after. And the toy maker too. The End The Magic Stag there were once a brother and sister who loved each other dearly. Their parents were dead. When they were very young, their mother had died and their father was ill. Before their father died, 
he married again. But their stepmother was most unkind and cruel to them. One day, the boy said to the sister, Dear little sister, our stepmother gives us dry hard bread crusts for dinner and supper and threatens to kick us out of the house. Let's run away and see what the world is like. So they went out and wandered here and there till evening. At the end of the day, they were in a large forest. It began to rain. They were tired and hungry and sad. They crept into a hollow tree and slept till morning. When they awoke, they left their place of shelter and wandered away in search of water. Oh, I am so thirsty. If we could only find a brook or a stream. Listen, I think I hear a running stream. So he took his sister by the hand, and they ran together to find it. Now the stepmother of these children was a wicked witch. She had followed them into the night and bewitched all the springs and streams in the forest. Brother and sister reached the brook, and the sister heard the babbling of the brook. Whoever drinks of me, a tiger soon will be. Whoa! Brother, wait! Do not drink, or you will become a wild beast and tear me to pieces! Thirsty as he was, the brother conquered his desire to drink at her words, and said, Dear sister, I will wait till we come to a spring. So they wandered farther, but as they approached, she again heard the bubbling of a spring. Who drinks of me? A wolf will be! Brother, I pray you do not drink of this spring. You will be changed into a wolf and devour me. Again, the brother denied himself and promised to wait. But he said, At the next stream, I must drink. My thirst is so great. Not far off ran a pretty streamlet. But here also, in the murmuring waters, the sister heard the words. Mm, who dares to drink of me, turn to a stag will be. Dear brother, do not drink, she began. But she was too late, for her brother had already knelt to drink, and he became a fawn. But he did not run away, and stayed close to her. So she said, Stand still, dear fawn. Don't fear. I must take care of you. I will never leave you. So she untied her golden garter and fastened it around the neck of the fawn. Then she gathered some soft green rushes and braided them into a soft string, which she fastened to the fawn's golden collar, and then led him away into the depths of the forest. After wandering about for some time, she at last found a little abandoned hut, and she thought it would form a nice shelter for them both. So she led the fawn in and closed the door. Every morning, she went out to gather berries for her own, and fresh grass for the fawn, which he ate out of her hand, and then he went out with her and played. After they had been alone in the forest for years, the little sister had grown into a lovely maiden and the fawn a large stag. Once a prince came to the forest with his hunting party. The sounding horn, the barking of the dogs, the yelling of the huntsmen resounded through the forest and was heard by the stag. He begged his sister to let him go to see. She opened the door and said, I will let you go, but do not forget to say, Dear sister, let me in when you return this evening. The chief hunter very soon spied the beautiful stag with the golden collar, pointed it out to the prince, and they determined to hunt it. They chased him with all their skill, but he was too light and nimble for them to catch. And after the huntsmen were gone, he walked home. But one of the prince's huntsmen, however, determined to follow him at a distance to find out where he went. The huntsman was very surprised to see the stag go up to a door and knock and hear him speak. Dear sister, let me in. The door was only opened a little way and quickly shut. But the huntsman had seen enough to amaze him. 
and when he returned to tell the prince what he had seen, the prince was amazed too. We will have to discover this mystery. The next morning, the huntsman led the prince to the cottage. When the prince saw it, he went on alone. The door was ajar. The king stepped in, and in great astonishment, saw a maiden more beautiful than he had ever seen standing before him. She looked frightened. After a little talk, he held her hand and said, Will you go with me to my castle and be my dear wife? Uh, yes, I would go willingly, but I cannot leave my dear stag. He must go with me. He shall remain with you as long as you live. While they were talking, the stag rose up, looking happy. Soon after, their marriage was celebrated with great splendor. The wicked stepmother who had caused these two young people such misery heard of their happiness. Envy and malice arose in her heart, and she has sworn to destroy them. She disguised herself as a nurse and came to the castle when the queen had a baby, and the prince hired her to take care of the queen and newborn. She locked the queen up in the bathroom and picked a baby from his cradle to throw him out of queen's balcony. But then the stag came to rescue, and he saved his nephew. The king came into the queen chambers, and he saw that the stag was protecting the baby from the nurse, and the queen recognized her as the witch stepmother. She told the king how cruelly she had been treated by her stepmother, and so the king sent her to the prison. The stepmother realized her mistake, and so she broke the spell which held the queen's brother in the form of a stag. He appeared before them, a tall, handsome young man. After this, everyone lived happily and peacefully for the rest of their lives. The End The Magic Porridge Pot Once upon a time, there was a sweet little girl named Melody. She lived with her mother in a small cottage. They were very, very poor, but Melody tried to make her mother happy by singing songs to her. Every day, Melody used to go into the woods to find something to eat. She used to bring back whatever she could find, but their bellies were never full. One day, saddened with their poverty, Melody left the house and went into the woods looking for something to eat. No matter how hard she searched, there was nothing to be found. Finally, Melody could bear it no more. She sat on a rock and started to cry. While crying, she sang a sad song in her sweet, melodious voice. Hearing her voice, a forest fairy appeared in front of her and said, What happened, my child? Why are you crying? And what are you doing alone in the woods? I am here to find something to eat for me and my mother. We are very poor and very hungry, said Melody with grief on her face. Don't worry, the fairy said. And with her magical wand, she changed a pebble into a big magical pot. Melody was amazed to see the magic. Take this pot home, and your family shall never be hungry again. I don't want to be rude, but what good is an empty pot if there's no food in it to cook? Melody said in a disheartening voice, to which the fairy answered, This is a magical pot. When you want something to eat, say, Cook, pot, cook. And when it's ready, say, Stop, pot, stop. <sighs> Melody was delighted with the gift she got from the fairy. And, with due respect, she asked the fairy, Oh, dear fairy godmother, 
I don't have enough words to thank you. Please, tell me what I can do for you in return. I don't want anything in return. But if you want, you can sing me a beautiful song every day. Before Melody could ask any more questions, the forest fairy disappeared. When Melody arrived home with nothing but an empty pot, her mother was very unhappy and said, What use is the pot if you have nothing to cook in it? Melody lifted the pot to the table and simply said, Cook, pot, cook! Nothing happened. Melody looked worried, but then the pot started to shake and hissed. The steam rose and up bubbled the creamiest porridge they had ever seen. Melody's mother understood that the pot was magical. She was so hungry <laughs> that she could mm. not resist the mm. creamy mm. porridge, oh, it's and delicious. she licked it with mm. her finger. She was overwhelmed with the taste of the porridge so much that she did not pay attention to Melody's other command. Stop, pot, stop! They ate and ate until the pot was empty and their stomachs were full. Melody's mother rubbed her stomach happily. Melody then thought, Oh, it's time for me to go and sing a song for the forest fairy. So she left the house and went into the woods again. Here at home, <laughs> her mother was so happy Ta -ta. that they would never have to worry about the food again. She collected all the old pots in which she used to cook <laughs> and threw them away bye bye. to make space See for you the new later. one. Or not. She polished and patted the new pot. All this hard work made her hungry again. Cook, pot, cook, she commanded. And presto, from inside the pot, more delicious <laughs> porridge bubbled up. Not even bothering to get the bowl, she ate directly from the pot. Mmm, delicious! But as quickly as she ate, the pot kept filling up until it was set to bubble up right over the edge. Oh dear, how did Melody make the pot stop? Enough pot, enough! But the pot bubbled on. It's plenty, Pot. It's plenty. The porridge steamed over the edge onto the table. Really, that will do. The porridge pours over the floor. Melody's mother starts to panic. Cease! Uh, finish! No more! She commanded. Soon, she realized that she had made a great mistake and ran away. The porridge poured out from the doors and windows onto the streets, bubbling and forming a great wave and rolled through the village. People gathered up on their rooftops and started to call for help. Melody heard the villagers calling out in distress. She raced down the woods towards the village. She took a wooden plank and a stick and rode towards her house. When she reached just outside her house, she shouted, Stop, pot, stop! And that is just what the pot did. As the bubbling subsided, Melody saw that all the villagers were reaching down and lifting a handful of creamy porridge to their mouth. The whole village enjoyed the porridge. They ate and ate and ate the whole winter long. And no one in the village was hungry ever again. The End The Magical Bottle Abu was a fisherman. He lived near the beach and had been fishing for as long as he could remember. When he was young, he would stay at sea all night. 
In the morning, he would return with a big catch of fresh fish, which he would sell at the local market. And now, Abu was almost eighty years old, and too old to go out to sea in his boat. So instead, he would throw his net out from the shore four times a day. He would eat some of the fish, and the rest he would sell for a little money. One day, he went out to the sea in the morning. He threw his net over the water. After some time, he could feel something heavy trapped in the net. He pulled and pulled and pulled, and it took all his strength to get his net up onto the shore, and found a dead donkey tangled in the net. Oh no! He cried. All this effort for a dead donkey! What will I do? What can I eat? So he thought about old King Solomon, an ancient king who was known for his wisdom. And then the old man once more cast his net into the water, and soon he could tell he had caught something. This time the net was even heavier. With all his strength again, Abu slowly pulled up the net to shore, and inside was a barrel full of sand. Oh no! He cried again. All of this effort for a barrel full of sand. What will I do? What can I eat? Again, he thought about King Solomon's great wisdom, and decided to persevere. Abu cast his net into the water a third time. This time, something even heavier got trapped in the net. It made a clanging sound like pots and pans banging against each other. And guess what it was? A whole bunch of old pots and pans. They were all rusted and of no use. So Abu looked to the sky and cried out, "Ah! Why do I deserve this? I have only the strength to cast my net four times in each day, and I've already done it three times. If I cannot catch any fish the fourth time, I'll surely die of hunger today. Why must I capture all of this junk?" With his prayer on his lips, Abu threw the net one last time. This time, something even heavier got trapped in the net. Abu had to wade deep into the water to pull the net out. He saw it was a brass bottle. This time, Abu was happy. Even though he had not caught any fish, the brass bottle looked solid. Perhaps he could sell it for more gold coins and have enough food for the next month. But he saw that the bottle had lead seal on it, and looking closely, Abu realized that the seal was none other than King Solomon's. He was now very curious to know what was inside the bottle. He opened the seal with a knife. As soon as he opened it, a huge magical creature came out from the bottle. It shot out one hundred feet into the sky with a huge roar. Abu was so scared he cried out in fear. The creature noticed Abu and shrunk down to just ten feet, so he could talk with Abu. Fisherman, did you free me? It thundered. Me? Uh, yes, yes, magical creature. My name is Abu. Abu, a fine name," said the creature with a smile. I have been trapped in that bottle for a long time. Thank you, fisherman Abu. Now tell me, how would you like to die? Die? But, sir, I freed you. Why would you want to kill me? I was trapped in that bottle by King Solomon, fisherman Abu. But Solomon ruled this land almost two thousand years ago. Yes, eighteen hundred years ago, to be precise, I rebelled against him. So Solomon defeated me and trapped me in this bottle. Then he had the bottle thrown into the sea. I have regretted my mistake ever since. But that means I have freed you from prison. Why do you want to kill me? For a thousand years, I wished someone would free me. I pledged that I would give that person enough wealth to last his lifetime, but no one came. 
Then in anger, I pledged that I would kill the man that would free me. But I would allow that man to choose the way he would die. <clears throat> so, how would you like to die, Fisherman Abu? Abu thought again of King Solomon's wisdom, and then a clever idea came to him. Sir, you claim that Solomon trapped you in that bottle? But I don't believe you. What? cried the creature, and his voice boomed like a hundred thunders. You are so tall. Your hands are like the trunk of the tree. There's no way you could have fit inside that tiny bottle. I don't care if I die, but I don't want to be killed by a liar. You puny fisherman. I may be evil and mean and make stupid promises, but I never lied a lie in my life. Then prove it, said Abu. The creature swished its hands. It turned into smoke and slowly, bit by bit, entered the bottle. And from inside it shouted, See? I can fit into this bottle. Abu quickly picked up the lead seal and trapped the creature inside the bottle again. The creature tried his best to come out, but he could not break the seal. Then the creature roared in thunder, but then calmed himself down and said sneakily, You tricked me! I give up. You're too clever for me, Abu. Now... I wish to get out of this jar, and I pledge I will give the man who freed me his youth back. Good deal, right? Come on, free me. Free me, Abu. Your prize is waiting for you. Abu listened calmly, and with a cunning smile, he said, <laughs> You think I am a fool? I have lived my life to the fullest, and I don't need anything more than that. I may be old but not foolish enough to free you again. Now, bye-bye! No, wait. Let me make another deal for you! Abu threw the bottle back into the sea and was grateful that his life was saved. The End The Magical Wishing Pond Once upon a time, there was a little princess named Jasmine. She was her father's only child, and she was spoiled. She was very stubborn and very selfish. She was always hungry for delicious food. One day, a magician visited the king to give him blessings and to warn him about a magical wishing pond within his dynasty. O oh, king! I came here to give you an ominous warning. Ooh, about a wishing pond in your state, which is... At the same time, little Jasmine was passing by the courtroom, and she saw the magician talking to her father. She got excited when she heard about the magical wishing pond. As soon as she heard about a magical wishing pond, she ran to her room without staying to listen to the magician's full sentence. I must go to the magical wishing pond to ask for delicious food. The next day morning, Jasmine hurriedly got ready and started her journey towards the pond. At noon, she reached it with few gold coins in her pocket. She wanted to wish for many things, like a delicious cake, ice cream, hamburger, pizza, crispy turkey, chocolates, cookies, and many more. But when she read the warning sign at the pond, she was disappointed. It said, one wish per person. Magic pond, magic pond, give me a wish. Grant me a food pot, which will give me a treat. Suddenly, a magical pot came up from the pond, following a whisper. Here is your wish. What do you ask for? Follow my instructions, or it will work not. You have to say three magical words. Ting, tong, twang. Then the magical pot will begin making delicious food. It will fulfill your hungriest desires. But do not forget to say stop 
pot stop, or else it will make food non-stop. Okay, whatever. Jasmine came back to her palace. She was very curious about the magical pot, and mumbled the magical words. Ting tong twain! I want chocolate cake and cocoa pudding. Magically, the pot started making a fountain of chocolate pudding and cake. Jasmine dove in, and ate as though she were starving. Days and days passed as she asked for her every kind of food she could think of. She started to gain lots of weight. One day, King visited her. He saw a fat kid eating a chicken leg, and he came near. He didn't realize it was his daughter until he came closer. He was surprised and said, "Oh, my, my dear princess, what have you done to yourself?" Father, I visited a magical wishing pond a few days earlier and asked for a magic food pot. Now, for the last few days, I've been making wishes for food, and last night I forgot the magical words to stop the pot. The king realized how selfish and greedy she was, and he held the crying princess in his arms and said, "Dear princess, you never listen to anyone." I know you heard that magician talk about the magical wishing pond, but you must not have listened to everything he said. Oh, king, I came here to give you an ominous warning. Ooh, a wishing pond in your state, which grants wishes, but those wishes always come with a consequence. It is an evil magical pond. I suggest you destroy it as soon as possible. Now you know, my dear princess, why this is happening. Then the king summoned his guards and ordered, "Pick up that pot and burn it in the fire." Immediately, guards followed the instructions, and they put the pot in the burning stove. And watched till it melted and turned to ashes. Afterward, the princess started to do daily exercise, and soon she came into her original shape. After that, they lived happily forever. Moral of the story: Never act on half-heard stories. The end. The three. Magical wishes. Once upon a time, in the city of Florence, there was a very handsome and intelligent little boy named Johnny, who had lost his mother when he was very young. After several years, his father got married once again, and now he was taken care of by his stepmother named Rubella. She was a cruel woman who desired to destroy Johnny and his father. I don't like this boy and his father, but first, I have to get rid of this young one. What can I do to get him to leave this house? I don't feed him, I don't treat him well, and he is still here. Meanwhile, Johnny was sitting at the table. Ah,、uh, this bread is so hard. I have to go to the water fountain and soak it in some water so I can eat it. When he was at the water fountain soaking the bread. An old man who looks dirty passed by. I am so hungry. Can you please give me a piece of your bread, little boy? Of course, sir. It's just that it's very hard, and I don't have something better to give you. I don't mind. And the old man ate the bread. Thank you, son. You just did a good deed, and you deserve a reward. You should know that I am not a beggar, as it seems. I am a very, <coughs> a very powerful wizard. <coughs> I will grant you three wishes. Johnny scratched his head and thought about what he wanted. Well, I've been thinking, and I want these three things. First, that every time my stepmother looks at me, she must start laughing. And laughing and laughing. Second, I want a ball, 
that whenever I throw it, it will not stop bouncing. And uh, third, a magic flute that can make people dance. Your wishes have been granted. Here, you have your bouncing ball and your flute. Then the man disappeared, and Johnny went home. He went straight to see his stepmother. Mother, I just finished eating my bread. Very. (laughs) Oh my, I can't stop laughing. (laughs) And the more she looked at the boy, the more she laughed. Why are you laughing, Mother? (laughs) What is so funny? He then realized that the spell was working now. Ah, I will uh, go to my room now. See you tomorrow. (laughs) And as soon as the boy left the room, she stopped laughing. What is wrong with me? I couldn't stop laughing. And every time the boy came to see his stepmother, she would start laughing. She couldn't do anything. She couldn't cook, take care of the house, eat, and she couldn't even sleep. She could only laugh and laugh. There must be someone who can help me. I can't go on like this. She asked the doctors for help, but none could find a cure. The doctors gave me medicines, but they wouldn't help. I wonder who can help me. I know. I will go to the hill. People say that a magician lives there. They say that he is very wise. So the next day, she went looking for the magician. Hmm, you are under a spell. I think it was my stepson. He put a mysterious and magical spell on you. Let me talk to him. And the magician went to the water fountain, where he found the boy Johnny soaking his bread. Hello, young boy. Who are you? I am someone who is trying to help your stepmother. Tell me at once, what did you do to her? I didn't do anything. Who did you talk to these last few days? What have you been doing? Tell me. Uh, You ask too many questions and I'm getting tired. Do you see this ball? Yes. Why? Then the boy threw the ball and it started bouncing and bouncing. If you get the ball and make it stop, I will tell you what you want to know. The magician chased the ball throughout the field until he got lost along with the ball. Since the magician couldn't get the information, the stepmother decided to take Johnny to the king. What are the charges against this young boy? He's a wizard. How do you know? (laughs) Well, every time I look at him, I can't stop laughing. (laughs) Hmm. I can see that. You can hardly talk. Anyway, I'm in a hurry. Boy, you have to go to jail. Very well, but before going to jail, I would like to play my flute. Play it as long as you want. As soon as Johnny started playing the flute, his stepmother, the courtiers, the king, and everybody at the court started dancing and jumping as if they had springs attached to their feet. I am exhausted. I can't go on like this. Mercy, mercy, please have mercy. King, if you promise me that I will be free and that you will keep me away from my stepmother, I will stop playing the flute. I promise, I promise. The boy stopped playing the flute and suddenly everybody stopped dancing. As for your stepmother, she will have to move to the farthest town away from you, and she will never return to this town or bother you ever again. 
Oh, thank you. And after that, little Johnny lived happily ever after in peace. The End